You're watching a BBC News special live from Westminster, where in the next hour we'll find out who's won the race to become the new leader of the Conservative Party and the UK's next Prime Minister. Yeah. Boris Johnson is the front runner ahead of his rival Jeremy Hunt. But for now, nobody knows for sure which of the two men has been chosen by Tory party members. The winner of the election will be announced here, inside the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre here in Westminster. Well, they'll make their first speech as leader moments later. This is the scene outside the hall, where MPs and officials are starting to arrive to take their seats. Norman Smith is there for us. Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt are expected to arrive here in the next few minutes. The challenge facing whoever wins, enormous. To unite the Tory party, end the division in the country and deliver Brexit by October the 31st. We'll take you through every step of the critical day as the Conservative Party selects the UK's next Prime Minister. Good morning and welcome to Westminster. Within the next hour, we will know who will be our next Prime Minister as the result of the Conservative Leadership Contest, which is announced soon. This is the scene live at the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre here in Westminster, where the outcome of the ballot of Conservative Party members will be revealed. Well, Boris Johnson, is the clear favourite over his rival, the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. But Mr Johnson could face ministerial resignations before he even enters Downing Street, as several Cabinet members say they can't support his do-or-die pledge to leave the EU by the end of October. Well, this is what we're expecting to happen over the next hour. One of these two men, Jeremy Hunt or Boris Johnson, will be voted in as leader of the Conservative Party after a ballot of about 160,000 Tory party members. We're expecting that result in about 40 minutes from the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre in Westminster. After the result is announced, the new Conservative leader will make his first speech just afterwards at around 11.50. The winner will officially become Prime Minister on Wednesday. Well, our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, is outside the QE2 centre for us now. Norman. Simon, the envelope with the result has been handed over to two of the executives from the Conservative 1922 Backbench Committee. I'm told they haven't opened it, won't open it, until just moments before Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson go on stage. Before that, both men will be taken to one side and told privately the result. The expectation is that it will be a win and a big win for Boris Johnson, although his team this morning were just trying to play down expectations a bit. But if he does secure a commanding victory, that will hugely strengthen his hand, yes, in delivering the sort of Brexit he wants to deliver, but also in facing down those critics beginning to muster on his back benches to oppose any move to take Britain out without an agreement. This morning, as he left, Mr Johnson was not count taking anything for granted. Is this your dream job morning, at a nightmare morning, time, Mr morning, Johnson? Morning, morning, morning. morning. You've waited your whole morning, life morning, on him, How are you doing, Mr Johnson? Have you got a top team in place? All play for, all play as for Jeremy Hunt, I spoke to him just as he was arriving at Cabinet this morning and I said, is it all over for you? And he said, it's just about to begin, isn't it? And he may have a point because we are heading into extraordinary uncertainty, whether indeed the next government will be able to survive with a tiny majority now of just two. As for Mr Hunt, he has fought perhaps a much more challenging and combative campaign than many expected. And this morning, he was not conceding defeat. <laughs> um, do you think you've won, Mr Hunt? Well, who knows? Do you know who has won? Do you know the result? No, I don't. Are you feeling positive? I'm feeling very positive, but uh, who knows what's going to happen. So, if you don't uh, win, will you serve in a Boris Johnson cabinet? All to be seen. Let's wait for the results. Would you like to stay on as Foreign Secretary? I'm going to walk to work. Don't worry, I'm not at a rock concert. It's all kicking off here. We've got opera singers belting it out. We've got people's vote people belting it out. 
It's a carnival, circus, surreal, call it what you will. With me, though, is prominent Boris Johnson backer, Pretty Patel. Let's try and shout above the noise. Let me ask you this. How does Boris Johnson complete task one, which is uniting the Tory party after what has been a pretty bruising campaign? Well, I think, first of all, that's the main priority. You know, today is all about unity. We are having a fresh start in our party, a new leader, long overdue change, and that gives us all a fantastic opportunity to unite as a party, come together and do something that is incredibly important when we look around us here, which is put our shoulder to the wheel now, and that's to get on and deliver Brexit. What do you say, though, to those of your colleagues who have, in effect, put Boris Johnson, if he wins, on notice that if he seeks to take this country out of the EU without an agreement, they could possibly help to bring down his government. What would you say to them? Well, I think, first of all, it is imperative that we deliver Brexit. And we also have to remember that, you know, we, there is no scope now for self-indulgence and individual MPs just expressing their own views. For the Conservative Party to deliver for our country, we have to unite, we have to come together, which means that as a party collectively in Parliament, we've got to work day and night now to deliver and actually work to negotiate the right kind of arrangement, the right kind of agreement that can take us out of the European Union. We know what Boris Johnson offers to Brexiteers. What does he offer to Remainers? How does he reach out to those in the country, the 48%, who are worried about what a Boris Johnson Brexit might look like? Well, I think actually no one should be worried about what Brexit should look like under Boris' leadership, primarily because he's spoken very, very clearly throughout his own campaign that he will unite the country by delivering Brexit. And of course, all this nonsense about resignations and people saying that they don't want no deal, we have to remember that many of those ministers and members of parliament stood on a platform back in 2017 where no deal was better than a bad deal. So of course, we want to get the best deal, a better deal for Britain, a better deal for our country, which effectively means that we will deliver Brexit, but then move on and focus on all the big issues that matter to the British public. How confident are you, though, that Boris Johnson will actually deliver the sort of Brexit you want? In other words, not a reheated Mrs May's deal, because there have been suggestions that he may have struck a fairly hard line during the campaign, but once it comes to the negotiations, he might have to go back to something similar to Mrs May's agreement. Well, I think first and foremost, Boris has been very clear, he will negotiate in good faith. And I think we have to start from that premise. And also that means having proper negotiations and engagement. He will spell out, obviously, the negotiating strategy, the language that he's going to use. But his focus, he could not have been any clearer during this contest. He is going to deliver Brexit. We are going to leave on October. October the 31st, which means basically the whole machinery of government, parliament, members of parliament and the Conservative Party uniting and coming together and working hard to actually get to that end state where we are going to leave. Pretty Patel, thanks uh, very much for your time. Well, we expect Boris Johnson, if it is him, to say a few words after the result, a speech of about 10 minutes or so. We're told the theme will be, it'll be that message of unity, but I guess the first real test of that will come in the composition of his cabinet and how far he's ready to keep or to bring in former former remainers or whether this becomes a much more one-dimensional brexit cabinet that will give us a sense of how far boris johnson is truly prepared to reach out and try and bind this party together Norman, thank you very much. Norman Smith there. Well, with me now is the former Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rivkin. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just to pick up what Norman was just saying, whoever it is, and the assumption at the moment is that it will be Boris Johnson, uh, the first job is party unity, and, and so the choice of his cabinet is going to be crucial in that. Well, you're quite right. The first question is party unity, but the first phenomenon will be party disunity, as uh, a substantial portion of Theresa May's cabinet will have already resigned and have declined to join his government. So um, he will already have had to factor that into his decisions. So he, he inherits an awkward squad and quite a big awkward squad. It's not just an awkward squad. That perhaps denigrates their importance. I mean, it's a question of him recognizing that just as he and his friends uh, were a thorn in Theresa May's uh, uh, time and were able, by relatively modest numbers, to prevent her getting what she wished. Actually, the positions are now reversed. There are at least, probably in my estimation, up to 50 Tory MPs who will not support no deal. And as long as he seems to be talking in that sort of language, uh, he will lose every vote in the House of Commons. 
you're a former foreign secretary, former defence secretary. Uh, would you rather, in your position, looking from the height of, of experience as you do, would you rather it was Jeremy Hunt? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm an optimist by nature, and we're told nowadays we have to be optimistic. And look, the sun's come out today, so maybe there's something in that thesis. But my problem with with Boris, I, I do, I have supported Jeremy Hunt. My problem with Boris is he's not Trump. He's not a, you know, uh, Boris is highly intelligent. He, he not only reads books, he's written them. And he's got very moderate views on everything apart from Brexit. My problem with Boris is not his opinions apart from Brexit. It is that I still have the gravest reservations as to whether he can cope with the burden of being prime minister. I worked with Margaret Thatcher uh, and John Major. They didn't have much in common, but what they did have in common was a, an enormous capacity to absorb the minutiae, the detail of the whole spectrum of government and therefore to give leadership. You you cannot give leadership if you don't know what's going on in so many parts of the government which you are responsible for. Which is why the choice of his cabinet is going to be absolutely crucial. Well, that will be very, very important, absolutely so. But those of his supporters who've said, don't worry, he will be a sort of non-executive chairman with excellent people around him. The last thing the United Kingdom needs at the moment is a non-executive chairman. We need leadership. And I think that's one thing that Boris himself would agree with me on. Uh, but the question is, can he provide it, not just in terms of the rhetoric and the speech but in terms of actual strategic control of the government which he will lead and actually knowing that he's dealing with other professional politicians, those in the European Union who he will need to negotiate with, they're not you know, second-rate uh, performers, they're actually damn good negotiators as I know from my own experience. He's a former Foreign Secretary, a former Mayor of London. Perhaps people are being a little unfair on him. He, he, he has held briefs and had to look at that sort of detail before. Well, you, you used a very interesting phrase. You said he has held briefs. That is exactly right. I don't think the judgment is that being Foreign Secretary was the high mark of his career in terms of his public reputation. He was a very good mayor of London, particularly at winning elections. I, I don't... I, I, Boris is far ahead of anybody else in terms of the star gold dust of campaigning. Uh, he connects with the public in a way that other politicians have not done for a long number of years. But that's only actually important when you're trying to persuade the public, either in an election or some other time, it doesn't work when you're dealing in negotiations with the Chancellor of Germany or the President of France or whomsoever it might be. I, I'm just hearing there's a rumour that Anne Milton has resigned from the government. Are we going to see throughout the day a drip drip of people saying, I'm, I'm off? Well, there'll be the people who don't want to serve under Boris, even though he might like them, uh, and there'll be those who uh, he doesn't choose to keep. Uh, because they don't meet his requirements. Remember, any Prime Minister has that very difficult dilemma. Uh, if you have 320 MPs, a maximum of 70 are going to be in your government, and some of these will be in the House of Lords. So there's going to be disappointed people, but this is a unique situation when actually people are queuing up not to serve in his government uh, rather than appear to be queuing up to serve in it. He'll still fill his government, that won't be a problem, but it's, the pro it's what comes afterwards, because uh, the government is already down to a wafer-thin uh, majority in the House of Commons. We have a by-election on Thursday in Brecon and Radnor, which we may or may not uh, hold. We may lose it to the Liberal Democrats. Uh, and that is the sign of things to come. Sir Malcolm, good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Well, in a moment, we're going to hear from Lorna Gordon. She's in Glasgow. Sean Lloyd is in Cardiff. But let's first go to our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy, who's in Belfast. And Emma, what could a new Prime Minister mean for Northern Ireland? And obviously, that backstop. Well, exactly. Having a new prime minister coming to power could have huge implications here in Northern Ireland. The arrangements for the Irish border having been some of the most difficult bits of Brexit to resolve. And now both Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson have said that the agreement that Theresa May made with the EU over the Irish border, that Irish backstop arrangement, effectively is now dead. They're effectively ripping that up, wanting to start afresh, if you like, and want to go back to the EU to renegotiate those arrangements. Now, just to remind people why Brexit has been so difficult for the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland is because you are taking one part of this island out of that big EU club we've all been part of for so long. Uh, and that means taking Northern Ireland away from the trading relationship and changing things almost overnight, if you like, with the way that businesses both north and south in this island have done uh, their trading almost seamlessly for so long now. And that was so difficult uh, in the Brexit negotiations for Theresa May. She signed up to the backstop 
arrangement, which could have meant that Northern Ireland effectively would have stayed in the single market while the rest of the UK left, leaving Northern Ireland more tightly bound to EU rules. And it was that fundamental principle that faced so much opposition uh, in Parliament. She couldn't get that deal through Parliament. The backstop had such strong opposition to it. It was one of the key reasons why she had to end her premiership uh, and resign. She was unable to get her Brexit withdrawal deal through Parliament. So will Jeremy Hunt or Boris Johnson be able to resolve that conundrum? Well, nothing's actually changed. The EU say they won't re renegotiate the backstop, that you cannot have a deal without signing up to those key set of rules. So they will face exactly the same set of difficulties that Theresa May did. Jeremy Hunt believes it can be solved through technology. Boris Johnson says let's move on to the future trading relationship. We'll sort the Irish border out there. Both of those have been uh, rejected already by the EU. So a lot of apprehension here about what the future will hold under a new Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to confirm that uh, rumour I brought to you a moment ago that Anne Milton has uh, resigned as a uh, government minister and she is blaming, uh, she's putting that down to her grave concern about the threat of a no deal Brexit. Uh, she said uh, uh, with regret she has taken this decision. Having abstained in a vote last week, I've resigned from the government. It has been an honour to serve on the Conservative front benches and she passed on her thanks to everyone she has worked with. So that's the first resignation while we've been on air. Uh, well, let's uh, go now to uh, Lorna Gordon, who's our correspondent there in Glasgow. And, uh, well, a lot of attention on what Boris Johnson, if it is indeed him, what his appointment would mean as, as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. And already Nicola Sturgeon has made her view clear on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for some weeks now, the warning bells have been ringing here in Scotland. Uh, they've been rung by politicians from across the political divides about what a potential Boris Johnson premiership would mean or could mean for Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's first minister, saying uh, Prime Minister Johnson would be a horrifying prospect, she believes, for most people. But it's not just her. The former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, a Labour politician, said that Boris Johnson has a long history of anti-Scottish invectives, which which will eventually come back to haunt him. The former Deputy Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr Clegg, uh, a Liberal Democrat, said that Brexit has left the breakup of the United Kingdom more likely than not. And David Lyddington, a Conservative, told the UK Cabinet just a few weeks ago that there was a real risk of the union splitting and the threat of crashing out of the union is more likely. Now, Boris Johnson seems very aware and alert to these warnings. He has said he will add the title Minister for the Union to the title of Prime Minister. He said he will protect the Barnet formula. He will set up a union uh, unit to stress test any policies in the context of devolution. But a couple of things worth noting. Uh, papers have been lodged today in Scotland's highest civil court asking to a cross-party group seeking what's called a declarator ruling that the Prime Minister cannot lawfully advise the Queen to suspend Parliament. They're doing it in the Scottish courts because they sit through August, allowing a ruling to be made before MPs return in September. And of course, most importantly of all, remember a majority of people here in Scotland voted against leaving the European Union. And there is polling, uh, polling to suggest that a no deal Brexit would push support for independence up to 60% if Mr Johnson does pursue a no deal Brexit. Lorna, thank you very much. Well, let's now go to Cardiff. Our correspondent there is uh, Sean Lloyd, and very similar arguments being discussed there. Yes, indeed, Simon. And well, both contestants really have their own supporters here from within the Welsh Conservative Party, with Paul Davis, the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, uh, having come out and backed Boris Johnson. But the main stance of the Welsh government in this context has been Brexit. And they've demanded that whoever takes the hot seat now in number 10 will rule out a no deal exit from the EU. And they say that a no deal would be catastrophic for Wales. I mean, we have the biggest agricultural show in Europe taking place at the moment in Llanelweth in mid Wales and the message from Welsh ministers who were there yesterday was that a no deal would destroy Welsh farming.
coming. They say that it would shrink the Welsh economy, there would be higher export taxes and higher tariffs on Welsh beef and on lamb. Now, the issue of Wales hasn't really featured much in the head-to-heads between the two contestants. There was a single hustings that took place here in Cardiff last month. Um, Boris Johnson did spark a row there where he suggested that um, ministers in London should have some say over how the cash that replaces the structural funds from the EU uh, should be spent here in Wales. He did, though, say that he would match fund those grants. And, of course, Wales has been a net beneficiary of EU structural funds over the years. And to give you a flavour of Plaid Cymru's response uh, to the two men, what they're saying here in Wales, well, they say that both Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson could not be a better advert for Welsh independence. Sean, thank you much. Sean Lloyd there in Cardiff. Well, watching events here just as closely as we are are those in Brussels. Let's go to our correspondent Adam Fleming who joins me now. And the question is for whoever takes over, the assumption here is that it's Boris Johnson. The question is whether they will hear any, any other word than no when they next approach Brussels. Well, the EU has said for quite some time now that the withdrawal agreement, the, the divorce bit of the Brexit deal, is not up for renegotiation. In other words, that means the Irish backstop will not be taken out. A time limit will not be applied. It will not be replaced by technological solutions. The EU says the only place where there's room for manoeuvre is the political declaration that sits alongside the divorce treaty, which spells out the shape of the future relationship and is a roadmap for the next phase of negotiations. They say that is where there is room for manoeuvre. However, there are going to be two factors that are different under a Boris Johnson prime ministership. Frankly, the EU had given up on Theresa May getting the deal through Parliament many, many months ago. Will they act differently with a new prime minister who may be able to demonstrate in some way that they have got more MPs willing to support the deal? And also, they've never really had to deal with a British government that was prepared to walk away with no deal. We learnt that in that panorama last week where Michel Barnier said it had never come up. Boris Johnson seems quite gung-ho, if you like, about the idea of leaving on the 31st of October with no deal, if that's what it comes to. Do those two factors combine to make the EU change its mind? Or is it the fact that the EU will stick to its principles on the Brexit negotiations, which are based on its red lines, which are based on a hard-headed analysis of its interests and EU law, and which the EU has stuck to religiously since those red lines were first written two days after the Brexit referendum in 2016? The other big question people in Brussels have is, which Boris Johnson, if it is him, will turn up? The pragmatist or the extremist? And when will he turn up? Will it be very soon or will he leave all of this until the last minute, perhaps not until October? OK, thank you very much as uh, we see Liam Fox there arriving. Let's go back to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, who's at the QE2 conference centre. We've got less than half an hour to go. We have. And the announcement that Anne Milton, another minister, has walked the plank and decided she cannot serve under Boris Johnson and is alarmed at the prospect of no deal. Anne Milton, of course, abstained in that crucial vote last week where MPs sought to thwart any attempt by Boris Johnson, if he does become Prime Minister, to prorogue Parliament. Well, joining me is Robert Buckland, Justice Minister, backed Mrs May's deal. However, very critical of the hardline Brexiteers. Do you think Anne Milton should have stuck in there? Look, I'm really sorry to hear that news because Anne Milton is an outstanding minister and has served the party and the government uh, with uh, great style. And I'm sad to see that she doesn't want to carry on in the new government if it is to be led by Boris Johnson. I think the message that all of us as Conservatives need to ponder on very carefully is how we not just bring the party together but also bring the country together and I think the result today is a moment for us to draw a line under the debates of the past and to unite behind the new leader. I'm hoping that's going to be Boris Johnson. I think that we have to respect and honour that result. Uh, and that means that we need to get together and unite quickly in order to uh, demonstrate that we can deliver Brexit and deliver for the British people.
Isn't there a problem in this unity pitch? And it is this. The hardline Brexiteers are quite happy to leave without any agreement. You and others are not. You want a deal. Well, look, I, I speak regularly to so-called hardline Brexiteers. I respect their position, but in the conversations I have with them, I get a sense that in the vast majority want some sort of deal. Now, frankly, so do I. And the choice now between, before us is between an orderly Brexit and a disorderly one. I will work as hard as I can if I'm given the opportunity within government or if I'm a backbencher to make sure that the Brexit we deliver actually is one that makes sense for business is orderly, shows this country in its best light rather than a crash out that I think would not only reflect poorly on Britain but reflect poorly on the EU as well. Isn't the reality though that if there is going to be a deal it is going to have to be something pretty similar to what Mrs May agreed, whatever Boris Johnson may have said during the leadership contest? Well look we've got a few months in which to do this. And I think that we have to accept that politically the withdrawal agreement is dead, but there is another way. And I think the other way is to look at the future relationship. The Europeans have said they would be happy to entertain a recalibration of that. And I think by reordering the future relationship, getting that clear, that could be the path for us to have a sensible withdrawal arrangement. Now, I'm hearing that people on all sides of the party are interested in that approach. I am pretty sure that the new Prime Minister will be considering that quickly. Robert Buckland, thanks very much indeed. Simon, it was interesting this morning listening to Michael Fallon on the uh, wireless key support, of course, of Boris Johnson, talking about an improved agreement, a better deal. And you do get the sense that for all the talk of Mrs May's deal being consigned to the dustbin, maybe, maybe bits of it will have to be picked out, looked at again, and maybe, maybe Boris Johnson will have to start thinking about some sort of backstop again if he's to get an agreement. Norman, thank you very much. Uh, as we look at the arrival there of Jeremy Hunt, of course one of the contenders arriving there with his wife, and we're just 20 minutes away. They will be told, uh, the two content contestants, uh, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, they'll be told shor shortly before the official is annou announcement is made which one of them will become the next leader of the Tory party and the next Prime Minister. Well, let's uh, pick up on what's going on uh, with me now. Uh, Henry Newman, director of the think tank Open Europe and former special advisor to Michael Gove, of course. Uh, Laura Trott, David Cameron's former political advisor as well. Thank you both for coming. Henry, uh, let's talk about Europe. Norman Smith suggesting there that Theresa May's deal is not entirely dead, that we may see bits of it forming the part of the next negotiation. Perhaps, and we don't know what Boris Johnson's Brexit strategy is, and that's the, the biggest single question for his government, uh, assuming it is Boris Johnson in about 20 minutes' time. We're going to look a bit silly if it isn't. Well, we might. Uh, but he set himself a test, do or die, Brexit by the 31st of October. That's in about 100 days' time. So we'll know pretty quickly whether his prime ministership is actually going to be a success or not. And he's going to have perhaps one of the shortest honeymoons of any new political leader. Normally when you come into government, it's a new prime minister, you're sort of given a bounce in the polls and the, the country and, and your party swings behind you. I think it's going to be much harder for Boris Johnson because the Conservative Party is only just holding on to power in Parliament with defections already to four MPs since the 2017 election. And they're also facing a sort of dual threat. On the one hand, a group of MPs willing to potentially bring down the government if they don't deliver Brexit by the 31st of October, which Boris Johnson's committed to. And on the other hand, a group of MPs who might do anything to stop a no-deal Brexit. Laura, we've already had our Milton resigning in the last few minutes. This issue of party unity is perhaps yes. the most important for Boris Johnson, in, if it is indeed him, in, in the next few days. And I think that'll be his biggest challenge. It's matching the expansive rhetoric which he's um, had during the leadership campaign with the realities of the parliamentary arithmetic which are going to become very apparent to him very quickly. He's got a majority of four that's going to become one after uh, the uh, by-election very soon and he's got to try and get a Brexit deal through a very divided house. So I'll be looking for him to do um, as much as he can to bring the party together in terms of his cabinet appointments and indeed his appointments in number 10 We've as just well. seen Jacob Rees-Mogg arriving at the QE2. Would there be a role for him, do you think? I think undoubtedly there's going to be a role for prominent members of the ERG. I mean, this is a, part of Boris's pitch is to begin to bring the party together and to be the candidate of the ERG and the person who's doing do or die for Brexit on the 31st of October. So I think there will be a role for prominent ERG members and Jacob is obviously one of those. I think we're about to see Boris Johnson himself arriving at the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre just around the corner from here. No, that's, that's uh, Sajid Javid. 
Um, again, Henry, it is figures, senior figures within the cabinet. Do you think there will be a view that Boris Johnson has, or whoever it is, that particularly with an international crisis with Iran going on now, Jeremy Hunt, despite everything of the last few weeks, better to keep someone like that in place while he's dealing with something like well, that? Well, if I was advising Boris Johnson, I'd be saying, look, you should reach out and build a team of rivals. Put the strongest players on the pitch at a moment of national crisis, both, as you say, in the Persian Gulf with Iran, but also, of course, with Brexit. So you want to bring the party together as much as possible, particularly given the hung parliament. I think, of course, he's set himself this deadline of October the 31st that we've been discussing. So I think whoever joins the cabinet will have to sign up to that. But beyond that, I would just go for the top levels of talent. And as Laura was saying, that will include some people from the ERG, but also some people from the other side of the parliamentary party as well. Because what he needs to be able to show is that he can bring the Conservative family back together again. And what we don't know is whether those, em those ministers who've been resigning uh, already over the weekend, David Gork, Philip Hammond, Rory Stewart, they've said they will do anything in some cases to stop a no-deal Brexit. Does that anything, as Meatloaf once said, he'd do anything for love, but he wouldn't do this. Would, would, would those people also risk actually bringing down a Conservative government through a no-confidence vote, in which case Boris Johnson may end up being one of the shortest Prime Ministers in recent history? Yeah, no honeymoon at all. I think you'd expect a bounce. And I think there is, despite uh, the disunity within the Conservative Party at the moment, everyone wants this to be over. And I think if, if Boris Johnson can get a deal, uh, then there is a lot of goodwill from the Conservative benches, at least, to get that through the House. And remember, Theresa's May deal passed with almost all Conservatives apart from the ERG. So if he gets something from, and it's a big if, from Europe, then there is that possibility that he can unite the Conservative Party. But I think the, the, the real difference that you're seeing, as Henry said, is, is around the kind of prospect of no deal and forcing Britain out without a deal. And I think some of his rhetoric around that has been quite divisive and it's why you've forced these couple of resignations. Laura, Henry, for now, thank you both thank very you. much for that. Uh, let's go back to the Queen Elizabeth Second Conference Centre. That's where everybody's now arriving. Our Chief Political Correspondent, Vicky Young, is outside with them. Vicky. Yeah, we've seen various members of the Cabinet. I can actually just see Chris Grayling over to my left there uh, arriving, the Transport Secretary. To be honest, not many people expect him to survive in his job. Uh, we've seen Jeremy Hunt arrive and other members of the Cabinet, including Sajid Javid, who is widely tipped to be the next Chancellor, possibly. I mean, it's interesting talking to the Tory MPs and Ministers who have all arrived here for this announcement. All of them think that Boris Johnson has won, but one of his ministerial supporters said to me, the question is not who's won. It's the question, really, for Boris Johnson of how long can he survive, given how difficult it's going to be, the problems uh, that he is going to face. Now, we've already seen uh, resignations in advance of the announcement. Anne Milton, the latest to say that she cannot serve uh, under Boris Johnson because she's not willing to go along with the possibility of a government uh, policy being leaving without a deal. So these are just some of the problems Boris Johnson is going to have uh, to deal with if he is confirmed, of course, as the next leader of the Tory party and then tomorrow uh, as Prime Minister. Now, uh, his strategy, his approach, of course, I think he wants to demonstrate that it's not just about Brexit. There will be other announcements, possibly about school funding, about social care, maybe about infrastructure projects. But, of course, it's Brexit that will define him and that will be the biggest test uh, of his premiership and, of course, the job uh, that he has wanted for so long. And I think that's the other striking thing. A year ago, 18 months ago, I think most people, including most MPs I spoke to, did not think that he would ever become Prime Minister. But things have changed, partly because I think the enemy has changed for the Tory party. Uh, Nigel Farage, uh, his prospects have been uh, resurrected after those uh, successes in the European elections. And of course, the fact that Brexit hasn't been delivered. And that's why Boris Johnson believes that the only way uh, that he can uh, be successful as Prime Minister and that the Tory party maybe can even survive is if he delivers Brexit. Vicky, thank you very much. We're with you back uh, soon, I'm sure. Vicky Young there at the QE2 Conference Centre. So looking a little further ahead, let's consider what all else this week in Westminster will bring. Because after the ballot of about 160,000 Tory party members, of course either Jeremy Hunt or Boris Johnson will be the new party leader. Tomorrow, Theresa May will take part in her final Prime Minister's questions here in the House of Commons. Shortly after that, Mrs May will head to Buckingham Palace to offer her resignation to the Queen. She'll then be swiftly followed by her successor, who will ask Her Majesty for permission to form a government. After that, the new Prime Minister will take to the Downing Street lectern to deliver his first speech as Prime Minister before announcing who will make up his new government. Then on Thursday, Parliament breaks up for its summer recess. It will resume on September the 3rd. Our assistant political editor Norman Smith is outside the QE2 conference centre 
for us. And of course, that underlines the fact that whoever becomes prime minister has not got a lot of time to sort out this Brexit uh, mess, as many people are calling it, obviously, before that deadline of October the 31st. Well, not only is there, you know, only months to go to the October the 31st deadline, but Mr Johnson, if it is him, will have to move extraordinarily quickly to construct a stable government. But the clues in the word stable with news that Anne Milton, another minister, has abandoned ship even before he's stepped into number 10. So you get a sense of the unease and disquiet amongst many Tory MPs at the prospect of a Boris Johnson premiership. And I think the first hurdle he's going to have to overcome will be one of tone. What is the sort of message he sends when we hear from him in the next, what, 20 minutes or so. It's going to have to be a conciliatory message reaching out to those in the Tory party who did not vote for him, who do have concerns about him, who are worried about his lack of grasp of detail, who are deeply uneasy about his apparent willingness to take us out without an agreement. Secondly, he has to speak to the 48%, those in the country who are alarmed by Brexit. He cannot just be a Brexit prime minister. He has to try and bring the country together and then he has to try and lock in a government that is actually going to function and that will start with a cabinet that reflects all wings of the party and it's been interesting just talking to some of those around Mr Johnson this morning they are talking about a broad-based cabinet you may have remembered a few weeks ago in the heat and battle of the leadership campaign there was a lot of talk about ensuring all cabinet ministers had sort of signed on the dotted line for no deal, that they weren't closet remainers. It was going to be a cabinet of true believers. That's all gone now. The message now is they will indeed be bringing in people who don't necessarily support Mr Johnson's approach to Brexit, a much more broad-based cabinet. And that is going to be, I guess, the first challenge for Boris Johnson setting out a unifying pitch for the party, for the country, and for those who are deeply, deeply wary still of Brexit. Norman, thank you very much with the helicopter shot there of the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Centre with Westminster Abbey there, bottom right of your screen, and uh, Parliament Square to the right of that, and we're just round the corner uh, outside the House of Parliament. Well, I'm joined now by two young members of the Conservative Party, Lacey Butcher and Cameron Bradbury. Now, you're both uh, Boris Johnson supporters, I think it's fair to say. I'm, we're, we're all going to have egg on our face if it's Jeremy Hunt, <laughs> but let's work on the basis, Cameron. Well, I, I know for a fact that you're actually rather missing the fact that Theresa May hasn't survived this. Yes, I think there was, I think she brought a pragmatic deal to the table. We'd have been out by now if MPs voted for it. Uh, I think she'll be remembered fondly, but moving forward, we need someone who can unify the party. And I think Boris, with the most support of the MPs, proven track record as Mayor of London, he's the right person to do that. Proven record? There are lots of questions about his job as Foreign Secretary, though. Not at all. I think Boris has proved himself time and time again to be a very charismatic and decisive character. He's proven himself in the Foreign Office, as well as a twice sex successful Premiership as, uh, as Mayor of London. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be the man to take us through Brexit and have a successful premiership thereafter. There are two Borises, people say. There's the, the bluff and the bluster Boris, and then there's the pragmatic Boris. Which one do you want to see dealing with Europe? Absolutely the pragmatic version of Boris. But I, I, Boris is a, is a controversial character. We've all known that from, from the get-go, from day one. I think that will be incredibly helpful in the negotiation process. Boris has kept his cards not you know, close to his chest. He hasn't exactly laid out his plans and his intentions. I think that's been very tactical and very, very clever in doing so. What sort of reputation, what does Boris Johnson have with younger people? Uh, I think he's rather um, popular amongst the Conservative youth. He's uh, one of the more liberal Conservative members, which is always positive. He's very pro-LGBT rights, for example. He voted to repeal Section 28. He was one of the first to speak out on same-sex marriage. I think he's also very pro-tax cuts, pro-business and op pro-opportunity, and that's really what resonates with young people. It's going to be about Brexit. And yes. do you think he will have got this country out of the EU by October the 31st. Categorically, yes. I mean, this is a legally binding... Yes. It's a legally binding date that we have to fulfil on. Boris is not taking no deal off the table, as that would be foolhardy. You don't go into a, a game of poker, let's say, and, and reveal all your cards at once. You don't want to remove that option from the table. He's being pragmatic in the way he's performing so far, and that's how he'll proceed. 
Is that a fair assessment? There are those that are um, saying this is quite a gamble. I agree with that. I think he would be... I think if I was Boris, I would try to make some minor changes to Theresa May's existing deal, as I think that's the deal you've been categorically, you know, they've stated that this is the only deal on the table and I want to leave with the deal. Um, but I think, you know, um, give Boris a chance to be Boris, I guess. But I think Theresa May's deal with a few minor tweaks could just get over the line. There are lots of people saying they don't want Boris to be Boris, they want to see a new Boris. Boris can only do what Boris is able to do. I mean, Boris has shown himself to be a very decisive character. His next step is finding his unifying cabinet and, you know, collective cabinet responsibility is going to be vital in the next 100 days to proceed on Brexit. Getting his cabinet in order and getting Brexit through thereafter. Lacey, Cameron, thank, thank you both very much for joining us uh, on what is a historic day here in Westminster. Let's go back to our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, who's uh, outside that conference centre for us. Vicky. Yeah, that's right. A lot of chat really over the last few days as people uh, expect Boris Johnson to become Prime Minister and from his friends and supporters about what kind of leader uh, he might be. Now, if you look at his track record, uh, he, of course, was a backbench MP for several years. Uh, didn't really make much of an impact. There were problems, of course, the headlines, the constant headlines about his private life. He even got sacked uh, after lying about uh, an affair. Uh, and then, of course, he became London mayor. And that's what his friends point to. They say that's what people need to look at as the template, if you like, for the kind of leader uh, that he might be. That when he became mayor of London, he was the front man, you know, willing to go out there in front of the cameras, a self-publicist, many would say. You know, we were looking just yesterday at, at shots of him when he appeared in EastEnders. So that's the kind of thing, the front man, you know, the gaffes, uh, the things that he did, which maybe got him into trouble, and his first photo opportunity, he fell into a river. Uh, all the kind of things that make people laugh, but don't necessarily make people want to have him as their prime minister. But the argument from his friends is that he puts people around him who can do the job, that he can give the sense of direction, be the front man. They make it happen behind the scenes. Now, I think lots of people would say that's all very well as London mayor quite hard to do as Prime Minister. It's a completely different situation. He's obviously got a hung parliament. I mean, barely a Conservative uh, majority uh, to work with. He's going to have to try and bring people together. Now, even his critics, I was speaking to one former cabinet minister who worked closely with him, doesn't agree with him at all about Brexit. But actually, they said that sense of optimism that he gives can be quite powerful, that he can bring people together he can try and get a unified uh, team together and it can work up to a point. But their fear is that he wants to please everybody, that he wants to be liked, he wants to please everybody. And that can be a big problem because it means that people go into a room and they all think that he believes what they're saying to him. And of course, that's going to be very, very telling uh, in the days to come. Vicky, thank you much. Vicky Young there. Well, that breaking story in the last half hour has been the resignation of Anne Milton and she is with me now. Good morning to you. Why have you gone? Um, I've signed on the vote on uh, the amendment on prorogation last week. And as a member of government, I think it's the honourable thing to do. I think um, now is the time for me to be on the back benches. What's important now is that we do the right thing for the country and indeed for my constituents. What about party unity? I think party unity is extremely important um, and I wish the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, well in his negotiations with the EU but I have always had grave concerns about leaving the EU without a deal in place. So whichever one of these two men it is, is that your view or are you working on the basis it is Boris Johnson? Well I resigned before the results I were know. announced <laughs> for that reason. As I say I abstained last week and I think as a government minister if you can't follow the party whip then you have to reflect on your position and um, it probably is the right thing to do to resign. So I am happy to go to the back benches now I've been in government for nine years um, and make sure that I help and support the new Prime Minister to make sure that we get a deal in place before we leave the EU. We've got protesters shouting, well done, you're putting country before party. But there are those in the party who are going to say, just at this moment, a new leader of the party, the next prime minister, is going to need all the help they can get. Well, and the new Prime Minister will get all my support from the backbenches. It doesn't matter whether you're in government or not. But I do have grave concerns about leaving without a deal. And I also abstained last week, so it's a proper thing to do. Do you think that Boris Johnson, when he says we're going to leave without a deal, 
Do you think that's a negotiation ploy or is that what he really believes? Well, it remains to be seen. I don't think that we will know until um, whoever is elected leader becomes Prime Minister and then we'll know more. But um, I will give my full support to the Prime Minister. As I say, I think that we need to make sure that we are mindful of the economy in this country. Former skills and apprenticeship minister, you know, I have seen been all up and down the country and I know what an impact leaving without a deal would have on our economy. Which is what? Because everybody is talking about the second phase of Project Fear. Uh, there are those that are saying, and you, you, you'll be fully aware of them, within your, within your own party, saying it would not be as bad as people are saying. So what are the public supposed to make of this? Oh, I think it's terribly hard for the public because, as you say, on one side it's Project Fear and on, on the other side people say this is the reality. I think whatever happens, people accept the fact that there would be some hit to the economy. There's lots of discussion about how long that would last, but I know that for a lot of business in this country, a lot of farmers, uh, a lot of my constituents, leaving the EU without a deal is not the, what they want and it's not what I want to see. I always thought that leaving the EU, which I have to say, I, I hope I don't get um, portrayed as a Remainer because far from it, I, I was not clear about how I was going to vote to the last minute in the referendum. But I've always and felt... did vote. And I did vote Remain in the end, but it was, you know, touch and go really, which way I would go. I've always felt that leaving the EU after all these years of being a partner needs to be a slow, gradual and managed process. Your resignation, does that herald the start of many others? You've got your... You've obviously been talking to people in the building behind me. How many do you think are going to follow suit? I, I don't know and in, in fact I haven't been talking to many people because I think what you have to do at times like that is to consider your own position and do what's right for you. Tough decision? It was a tough decision. I've had a, a fabulous job. I've always said that my previous job in particular was the best job in government. You know, I served as Deputy Chief Whip in the Whip's office. I was the first woman to ever be Deputy Chief Whip. And so I've had a fantastic opportunity in government, but uh, I still have an important job to do to represent my constituents. You want a sympathy for the Chief Whip now? It's quite a job. Well, <laughs> whoever that will be, um, it's a tough job in the best of circumstances. It's always tough. And Milton, good to talk to you. Thank you very it's much for joining us. Uh, so the uh, newsmaker so far, Anne Milton, who uh, resigned uh, government post a short time ago. Let's go back to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. There he is. Uh, it's very hot at the QET Centre outside and in. Scorchio here. Um, I guess listening to Anne Milton, Team Johnson, if he wins, will be disappointed. But I guess, too, they will be relieved that there hasn't been a stampede of ministers heading for the exit door, at least not yet. And everything I'm picking up is there's not likely to be. There may be a trickle but there's not going to be the mass resignations that might have destabilized his premiership before it even got up and running. And I think the reason for that is a lot of them are clinging to the hope that Boris Johnson as Prime Minister is going to be a very different kettle of fish to Boris Johnson as leadership campaigner. And they hope that once he has to actually get to grips with the negotiations and deal with the EU face to face, it's going to be a bit of a reality check for Mr Johnson and all this rhetoric about do or die and how we're going to leave come what may, well that might be dialed down a bit and actually he might have to pivot to a much more, shall we say, compromising position, maybe even an agreement that doesn't look a million miles from Theresa May. That's their hope. I have to say it seems to me to be an awfully, well, big call because certainly during the leadership campaign, throughout it, Mr Johnson has remorselessly ratcheted up his position. Um, I'm just looking behind me, what's going on? Some cars arriving. Is anyone arriving? Well, give me a shout if you see anyone behind me. Um, during the leadership campaign, Boris Johnson has remorselessly ratcheted up his rhetoric, narrowing down his room for manoeuvre. Um, so they are banking a lot on the fact that he's suddenly going to pivot when he becomes leader. It would also entail facing down the ERG, who it seems to me are pretty much got him in their grasp. They are policing him. They are watching him. And if they see any sign that he is departing from what they view as the true course of Brexit, they will be on to him. So, you know, a fascinating and fraught three months ahead with the Brexiteers hoping to hold Boris Johnson on their side, 
the Remainers hoping they can tempt Boris Johnson to their side. The big question, who is the real Boris Johnson? And in Downing Street, there is no hiding place. You have to stand up. So we are going to find out one way or the other who Boris Johnson really is. Uh, things are running a bit late, a little behind schedule. Uh, we've had the helicopter shot. I mean, it, it, Boris Johnson isn't there yet, is he? I mean, if there's one person you could recognise from a helicopter, it's going to be Boris Johnson. I've got a feeling, I may be wrong, but I'm not sure he's going to go in the front door. Um, I think he might go in the underground car park. We'll see. Um, could be wrong. Uh, if he does appear, it'll all kick off here. It's Plaza del Chaos here. Um, you'll hear all the crowds kicking off uh, if he does arrive. So I won't have to turn around and say, is he there? I'll know he's there. Um, but no sign of him at the <laughs> no sign of him at the moment. Bear in mind, he doesn't know at the moment. So in the back of his mind, niggling away is the possibility of the greatest upset in modern history as Jeremy Hunt comes cantering from nowhere like the sort of tortoise and the hare. Don't think it's going to happen, but that still has to be in Boris Johnson's mind. It's not a done deal. He doesn't know he's got it. No one in the Tory party, I think, knows yet because the envelope from the Electoral Reform Services Company, which carried out the ballot, was handed to uh, Cheryl Gillan uh, early doors this morning. I'm told she has not opened it, so she's presumably had it sitting in a handbag or in a pocket. Hope she hasn't lost it. That'd be a bit of a blow. Anyway, assuming she hasn't lost it, she will open it shortly before the big announcement. Before then, she will take Jeremy Hunt, Boris Johnson to one side and give them the result. Give them a few moments, a bit like Joe Swinson and Ed Davey yesterday at the Lib Dem leadership. Give them a bit of time to kind of gather themselves, get the game face on, to emerge in front of the cameras. Always one of the sort of most intriguing things, trying to read whose smile is real and whose smile is just plastered on uh, when they finally emerge in front of the camera. So they will only know literally minutes before we know. And then we will get a short statement from Boris Johnson. It's not going to be a grand State of the Union, my vision for this country kind of speech. It's going to be a much more curtailed speech, maybe about 10 minutes, basically a unity message. Live from the Plaza del Chaos. That's a new one. Uh, that's Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you later on. Thanks very much. Uh, let's rejoin uh, Henry Newman, uh, director of the think tank Open Europe, uh, former special advisor to Michael Gove, and Laura Trott, uh, Debbie Cameron's former political advisor, both here with me now. I, I mean, we are going to look a bit silly if Jeremy Hunt does come from behind, but all along it has felt like Boris Johnson's battle to lose, hasn't it? I think that's right. I think as soon as Boris Johnson made the final two and therefore went forward for the membership, it was likely that the members were going to choose a Brexiteer. And although Jeremy Hunt has tried to minimise the distance between his Brexit policy and Boris Johnson's, I think the membership are overwhelmingly likely to go for Boris Johnson as a sort of face of Brexit. Um, well, the, the interesting question will be the size of the mandate from the membership. There's a lot of discussion amongst Westminster watchers. Will Boris Johnson get over 70% of the vote, 75% of the vote? How much of a landslide will it be? I think that matters only to a certain extent, because really the challenge for Boris Johnson is not with the membership. The challenge for Boris Johnson is there in Parliament, where he's, his party, the Conservatives, are just holding on to power. And he's got a very, very divided uh, group of parliamentarians. And he needs to try and bring those together, whatever his mandate for the membership is. Laura, we just saw uh, his father, Stanley, brother Joe, sister Rachel, sitting there waiting for him to arrive. His family are going to be quite important, as indeed is his personal life. It's going to be an issue for a prime minister, isn't it? I don't know whether that's true, actually. I think, you know, Boris's private life has been all over the papers on numerous occasions. And I really don't think people care that much, uh, which I actually think is a good sign for the country. People care about what he says, what he does, whether he follows through. I think his personal life is less of an issue. As long as um, he doesn't try, uh, hypocrisy is always the thing that people try and pick out. As long as he tries, it doesn't try to play at both sides. I think that he doesn't need to worry about that side of things too much. It was interesting talking to Nigel Evans earlier, who said the first thing Boris Johnson has got to do is remove the knives, not from his back. They're, they're in his front, aren't they? Well, that's, that's the challenge he's going to face. And he's going to want to reshape the cabinet over the next few days. He'll be becoming prime minister formally uh, if he's invited to do so by the Queen. Decided? Well, I, I think uh, uh, from, from sort of reading things and uh, trying to under talk to people close to his team, the suggestion is it's not completely nailed down. But he's likely to make very, very sweeping changes to the cabinet on really quite an extraordinary level. I mean, it's, it'll be a night of long knives, changing the chancellor, possibly changing many other of the senior figures, and of course, the prime minister himself. That hasn't really happened for a very long time for the Conservatives, that there's been a change 
change of prime minister in government. And this is really the first time that actually in government the Conservatives have used their membership to select the next leader of the party. That happened, of course, first in 2005 when David Davis was beaten by David Cameron, but that was when the Conservatives were well in opposition. So this is the first time that actually the vote has gone through to the membership to choose the actual leader of the country as well as the leader of the party. Now, they're just looking at a video which uh, lasts about a minute, so we're very nearly at the moment. Um, I'm going to let, let's see if I can rejoin Norman, who's who's outside. Um, just what's the, the atmosphere like there, Norman? Because this is a moment of history. Um, well, yes, it is, but it's slightly kind of been taken down a notch or two because we've all kind of thought, well. Boris Johnson's going to win. So it's a funny sort of moment because this is the moment the result is announced, but then it slightly dips flat again because he doesn't actually take over as Prime Minister until tomorrow. So we still have this sort of little interim period of 24 hours or so until Mrs May's final PMQs. And then actually, I understand she's going to do another brief statement uh, in Downing Street. So, you know, we'll get another chance to hear Mrs May setting out what she believes she's achieved. So Boris Johnson doesn't actually take over probably until, what, four or five o'clock tomorrow. So it's a curious one, the sort of slight delay and the sort of expectation that it, it's, it's in the bag, let's be honest, that's what most people think. That has is, that is lowered the temperature a bit. However, don't think it's all rather dull. It's going to pick up big time very, very quickly because very, very soon Boris Johnson is going to have to get stuck in setting out his vision. I'm told there probably will be a statement to the Commons on Thursday when he will set out his big pitch to MPs in the country. Norman, thank you very much. Now, uh, this video, the history of the Conservative Party leadership is uh, coming to an end, and then we will hear from the chair of the Conservative Party, that's Brandon Lewis, who will give a, an introduction. We're expecting that to be some three minutes or so, and then the candidates will enter the room and they will sit next to each other as it's announced. Let's join that proceeding now. Brandon Lewis. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> and this morning marks the culmination of a contest that has shown the very best of our party our values, our ideas, our people and our organisation. A party that is fundamentally strong and united in its common purpose. To deliver for prosperity, opportunity, fairness and security for everyone in our United Kingdom. I've been hugely proud as chairman of everyone in our party throughout this election. The voluntary, the parliamentary and professional party working together to deliver a fair and an efficient election. We've held hustings in 16 towns and cities right across the United Kingdom, in every region and in every nation. Our candidates have covered some 3,000 miles, taken over 400 questions and answered hours and hours worth of questions in interviews, culminating in that fantastic event at the XL just last Wednesday. And we have welcomed thousands of our party members and friends and family to hear directly from our candidates. And in a first for a political party, we held an online live hustings open to everyone in our country and indeed beyond. I want to pay tribute to the team at CCHQ in particular for running both the membership ballot and these fantastic hustings. And I also want to thank my parliamentary colleagues for their support through that process. In particular, the members of the 1922 committee, brilliantly led by Charles Walker and Dame Cheryl Gillan, who have been the returning officers throughout this process and have given us such an efficient, professional and effective start and run through this process. And to all of the members of the Conservative Party, thank you. Those members, our friends, our family and our colleagues, have undertaken a solemn duty in choosing our next leader, who will be this country's next Prime Minister. They have engaged constructively, thoughtfully and positively in the process. A chance to choose our leader is a privilege, and I believe our party has risen to that task. And finally, I want to take this opportunity to say a thank you to our current Prime Minister, Theresa May, for her leadership of our party and our country over the last three years, something that was never going to be an easy task. And it is now paramount that we come together, that we unite as a party for our country, 
to deliver in the national interest, to get behind our new leader and our next Prime Minister, to deliver on the results of the referendum and to deliver for the whole of the United Kingdom. And we are a party that does that best when we are united. And that's a party that will be led by one of our two fantastic candidates that we have seen out on the roads over the last few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. And ladies and gentlemen, to announce the results of the leadership election, please welcome our attorney officers, Dame Cheryl Gillen and Charles Walker. Well, thank you, Brandon. Can I thank you and your team at Conservative Central Office for doing a fantastic job. It's been a team effort and shown the Conservative family at its best. And if I could make one plea as a backbencher, can we be kinder to the next Prime Minister than we've been to the current Prime Minister? So without further delay, I'm going to hand you over to the wonderful co-chair of the 1922 committee, Dame Cheryl. Thank you very much, Charles. On the 24th of May, the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Theresa May, announced that she would be standing down as leader of our party on the 7th of June. And over the past 46 days, the 1922 committee organised five ballots of members of parliament and then worked with the party chairman and the electoral reform services to present the final two candidates so all qualifying members of the Conservative and Unionist Party could vote for our new leader. I want to echo Charles's thanks to Brandon and in particular to the party board and the party staff for all their sterling work on the hustings, and also the ERS, who have conducted a very professional operation, collecting and counting the votes from home and abroad. And also the 1922 executive, especially my co-chairman, Charles Walker, with whom it has been a pleasure to work, and at least we have brought uh, equality to the top of the 1922 committee. <laughs> Gender balance is important. <laughs> and the officers of the 1922 committee, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, Bob Blackman, and Nigel Evans, all together here today. And our own parliamentary staff, who have given up their spare time to help conduct what I believe has been a very successful election. Finally, I would like to thank all those party members who voted and those who stood in the election, and particularly my colleagues, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson, who, despite the challenges of a contest, run in the glare of press comment and public scrutiny, I believe have emerged as worthy candidates for the position of leader of our party. Now, I think you've all been waiting long enough. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in, in the honoured tradition, um, I'm going to ask my beautiful assistant to hand, hand me the envelope for the announcement. <laughs> it's called teamwork. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, Dame Cheryl Gillen, the joint returning officer for the Conservative and Unionist Party leadership election, declare that the total number of eligible electors 
was 159,320. The turnout in the election was 87.4%. The total number of ballot papers rejected was 509. And the total number of votes given to each candidate was as follows. Jeremy Hunt, 46,656. Boris Johnson, 92,153. And therefore, I give notice that Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Okay, right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much, Brandon, for a fantastic, fantastic, well organised campaign. I think it did a lot of credit, as, as Brandon has just said, to our party, to our values, and to uh, I, our ideals. But I want to begin by thanking my opponent, Jeremy, by common consent, an absolutely formidable campaigner and a great leader and a great politician. Jeremy, in the course of 20 hustings, in more, I mean 20 hustings or hustings style events, it was more than 3,000 miles, by the way, it was about 7,000 miles uh, that we did crisscrossing uh, the country. You've been friendly, you've been good natured, you've been a font of excellent ideas, all of which I propose to steal. Uh, forthwith. And above all, I want to thank our outgoing leader, Theresa May, for her extraordinary service to this party and to this country. It was a, a privilege. It was a privilege to serve in her cabinet and to see the passion and determination that she brought to the many causes that are her legacy, from equal pay for men and women to tackling the problems of mental health and racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you, all of you here today, and obviously everybody in the Conservative Party, for your hard work, for your campaigning, uh, for your public spirit, and obviously for the extraordinary honour and privilege that you have just conferred on me. And I know that there will be people around the place who will question the wisdom of your decisions. <laughs> uh, and there may even be some people here who still wonder what, quite what they have done. And I would just point out to you that, of course, nobody, no one party, no one person has a monopoly of wisdom. But if you look at the history of the last 200 years of this party's existence, you will see that it is we conservatives who have had the best insights, I think, into human nature, and in the, best in, the best insights into how to manage the jostling sets of instincts in the human heart. And time and again, it is to us that the people of this country have turned to get that balance right between the instincts to own your own house uh, your own home, to earn and spend your own money, to look after your own family, good instincts, proper instincts, noble instincts, and the equally noble instinct to share and to give everyone a fair chance in life, and to look after the poorest and the neediest, and to build a great society. And on the whole, in the last 200 years, it is we conservatives who have understood best how to encourage those instincts to work together in harmony to promote the good of the whole country. And today, at this pivotal moment in our history, we again have to reconcile two sets of instincts, two noble sets of instincts, between the deep desire for friendship and free trade and mutual support in security and defense between Britain and our European partners, and the simultaneous desire equally deep and heartfelt 
for democratic self-government in this country. And of course, there are some people who say that they're irreconcilable and it just can't be done. And indeed, I read in my Financial Times this morning, devoted reader that I am, seriously, it's a great, 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 great British, great British brand. I read in my Financial Times this morning that there are no incoming leader, no incoming leader has ever faced such a daunting set of circumstances, it said. Well, I look at you this morning and I ask myself, do you look daunted? Do you feel daunted? I don't think, we, I don't think you look remotely daunted uh, to me. And I think that we know that we can do it and that the people of this country are trusting in us to do it and we know that we will do it. And we know the mantra of the campaign that has just gone by. In case you've forgotten it, you probably have. It's always, always a couple of, it is deliver Brexit, unite the country and defeat Jeremy Corbyn. And that is what we're going to do. We're going to defeat Jeremy Corbyn. And I know, I know some, some wag has already pointed out that deliver, unite and defeat was not the perfect acronym for an election campaign, <laughs> since unfortunately it spells dud. But they forgot the final E, my friends. E for energise. And I say, I say to all the doubters, dude, we are going to energise the country. We're going to get Brexit done on October the 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can do. And we are once again going to believe in ourselves and what we can achieve. And like some slumbering giant, we are going to rise and ping off the guy ropes of self-doubt and negativity with better education, better infrastructure, more police, fantastic full fibre broadband sprouting in every household. We are going to unite this amazing country and we are going to take it forward. I thank you all very much for the incredible honour that you have just done me. I will work flat out from now on with my team that I will build, I hope, in the next few days to repay your confidence. But in the meantime, the campaign is over and the work begins. Thank you all very much. So, Boris Johnson, the new Conservative Party leader, and the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, with his father, his sister, and his brother there, and a warm tribute to, to Jeremy Hunt, the contender. He beat, by a vote, around two to one in that ballot, the result of which just announced. Not a huge surprise, and Boris Johnson outlining the three targets over the coming weeks, at least the next couple of months, and that's to bring Brexit to fruition, to unite the party, and to defeat Jeremy Corbyn. Well, let's go over to uh, Norman Smith, who's outside the QE2. I, not a great surprise. That wasn't actually vintage Boris Johnson either, was it? No, it wasn't actually. Um, he gave us, you know, the usual big optimistic pitch dispelling doubt. Are you daunted? You don't look daunted, he said. But I think he's perhaps saving himself. It's not the occasion that he really wants to set out his stall. I think that will come tomorrow when we see him outside Downing Street without a lectern, apparently. He doesn't want to be encumbered by the formal trappings. He wants perhaps to roam a little bit more freely, but I think that will be the moment when he speaks to the country. Bear in mind, this was a Tory party event. He doesn't want to be just a prime minister of the Tory faithful. He has to energize the country, not just the Tory party. So I suspect he was deliberately just holding himself back. And we got, you know, a fairly basic stump Boris Johnson speech, little dig at the FT, his favourite paper, he alleges. The scale of the victory, though, that is important, I think, because this morning his team were sort of on the blower to people like me saying, no, 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 you're quite wrong. This suggestion he might win 60% of the vote. It's going to be much, much closer than that. All sort of expectation management in the event. He wins with a huge, thumping great majority, which I kind of feel he always was going to win. This is a moment which, you know, many in the Tory party have been 
waiting for. They have always wanted Boris Johnson as their leader. Now they have got him. He's installed with a huge mandate. And that is important because that will at least give him liftoff. He won't have to struggle and be handicapped by the fear that actually he only just squeaked across the line. The rocket boosters are on. He's off, at least for now. And that gives him the freedom to appoint the sort of cabinet he wants. And all the signs are it is not going to be a true blue Brexiteer cabinet. It will include Remainers, those who don't necessarily agree with him, and that will form part of his core initial pitch, namely unite the party, unite the country. That is going to be the key message I think we're going to hear tomorrow outside Downing Street and then when we hear from him again on Thursday in the Commons in a statement to MPs before they go off for their long, lazy summer recess. Norman, thank you very much. That's Norman Smith outside the QE2 centre there, just around the corner. Well, joining me here outside the House of Parliament is uh, Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator, and deputy political editor of The Sunday Times, Caroline Wheeler. Fraser, it's quite a mandate. Oh, yes, it is quite a mandate. Two-thirds of Tory members. But then again, when this started, I would have thought he would have won by a larger margin, three to one, perhaps even four to one, given Boris's huge popularity. So we had a far bigger Conservative Party membership, 160,000 members. So perhaps there were people joining who weren't exactly signed into the Boris Johnson Brexit project, but nonetheless a decisive mandate. Not quite as big as David Cameron's, but big enough to get him to number 10. And Caroline, as he was saying in his speech, he's got three targets, but the unity of the party is going to be crucial. Absolutely crucial and of course just moments before the announcement was made that he was going to be the next Prime Minister another minister resigned basically citing grave concerns about the direction of travel in terms of him moving towards a no deal Brexit so unity is going to be absolutely pivotal for him when he has such a small majority we were just discussing how big that majority is it seems to differ depending on who you speak to whether it's three or four we've seen one um, MP potentially lose the whip this week uh, we've got a by-election in Brecon and Radnor that's going to become even slimmer if they lose that. But of course, Fraser, they'll be watching this in Brussels. And what do you think they'll read from what they've just watched? Well, that the Conservatives got somebody who is serious about Brexit. The important thing are the resignations. Those cabinet members who didn't really want to go through Brexit are quitting one by one by one. So Boris Johnson's cabinet, well, unlike Theresa May's cabinet, will be united in being serious about leaving by the end of October. So they should read seriousness of intent in this, because Theresa May would still be here if the Tories weren't serious. And Caroline, in, in terms of the cabinet, is, is it a case of he's going to have to keep his friends close, but perhaps the odd enemy closer still? Well, it's an interesting question and I think that's going to tell us a lot about the direction of travel for the Boris administration. He's already set a kind of artificial red line by basically saying he'll only have those people serving in his cabinet who are committed to leaving on the 31st and potentially leaving with or without a deal and that's really going to determine a lot of those posts. We've seen some um, former cabinet ministers and cabinet ministers go on a bit of a journey, even the likes of Amber Rudd who was the work, who was the work and pension secretary who initially was very opposed to the idea of a, serving under a Boris Johnson administration who now seems to be suggesting that she could pivot and actually support those terms so it'll be really interesting to see exactly who makes it into that final cut. Uh, Fraser, it was interesting Sir Alan Duncan yesterday trying to manoeuvre a way of uh, getting effectively a vote of confidence in, in the brand new Prime Minister tomorrow that's not going to happen but it underlines just how fragile things are. Yes, and just how annoyed the Tory Remainers are. I mean, to suggest a vote of no confidence in your new leader on his first day in the job is a measure of how how helpful a deputy Sir Alan was when he was Boris Johnson's deputy in the Foreign Office. But also, there's going to be a very serious conflict now. But the question for Sir Alan and the other Tories is would they be prepared to vote down a Conservative government to stop a no deal Brexit? Because that might be the only weapon they've got at their disposal. There aren't that many parliamentary manoeuvres. Boris doesn't need Parliament's permission to proceed with no deal, but they can stop him by triggering a general election. Now, how angry are Sir Alan and the, and the Tory Remainers? Are they angry enough to bring him down? I guess we're about to find out. Yeah. Fraser Nelson, Caroline Willer, thank you both very much for joining us. Well, let's go back to the fray, back to that uh, scene outside the QE2 conference centre. Vicky Young, our chief political correspondent, is there for us now. Vicky. Yeah, that's right. And cabinet ministers and ministers are streaming out after listening to their new leader, the man, of course, who will become prime minister tomorrow. I think over my shoulder there, I think that might be Andrea Leadsom. Hard to see here, but I think it is. Um, 
And speaking earlier to the Conservative piece going in, I mean, they all assumed that Boris Johnson was going to win this. And it was interesting talking to one minister who it has been a long standing ally of Boris Johnson. He said, the problem here is how long can Boris Johnson's leadership last? And that is from someone who supports him, who wants him to succeed. But I think that does highlight when Boris Johnson said to that audience, are you feeling daunted? You don't look daunted to me. Well, actually, a lot of them are very daunted by the task that lays ahead for them and for him, because there is really no majority for the Conservative Party, and they have this incredibly divisive Brexit issue to deal with. Vicky Young, our chief political correspondent there outside the QE2 conference centre, as those uh, Tory members who've been voting and watching the vote now leave, heading off to their uh, various offices to cogitate, to wonder what this all means. Well, you've been watching a BBC News special. And there's continuing political coverage throughout the day on BBC News. Now let's join Joe Coburn for further analysis with Politics Live.